Since the beginnings of this program 13 years ago, all of the IRP's projects have been based on the idea uh, that we need to do stories that no one else is doing and integrate grad students and recent grads into major work done collaboratively on multiple platforms. And when the late patriarch and matriarch of the Logan family, David and Riva, created the first chair in, in investigative reporting at the graduate school and asked, to Lowell, asked Lowell to sit in it, David asked him not just to continue doing the work and shed light on the truth, but make sure we, did, we made a little trouble in the process. With, the, with their passing, the IRP has enjoyed the steadfast support of their three sons, John, Richard, and Daniel. Daniel could not be here today, but John and Richard are here. Please stand up and accept our gratitude. And the Logan support has been amplified along the way by other individual supporters and foundations, all of whom we appreciate, including MacArthur, Ford, and Knight. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism, Ed Wasserman. Thank you. Ed. Thank you, John. And welcome, all of you, on this beautiful, lustrous Saturday morning. Um, and, and of course, this day is the opening day, although we uh, had a pre-opening yesterday. This is the opening day of the conference that strives to be the smartest and best-fed journalism conference in America. Um, uh, it, it's wonderful to see it having gotten even better this year. And, and congratulations to John for presiding over an expanded curriculum and a, a widening array of partners, and welcome to our new partners. Um, yesterday was thrilling, and I'm looking forward to more of the same today. Um, I, I need to say a little something about Lowell. I know he will be praised later on, deservedly, uh, and we'll have ample opportunity to talk about his accomplishments as a journalist, but as a dean here, uh, I want to say a, just a couple words about his accomplishments as an educator. Um, a generation of journalists cut their teeth on high-impact projects under Lowell's tutelage. They learned what journalism ought to be and how we seek to expose the wicked and advance the good. From Lowell, this is, sounds corny, happens to have the advantage of being true. Uh, Lowell says he's retiring. I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, I think this place is a little like being in the spy business or the mafia. Uh, it's not so easy to get out. My belief is that Lowell's journey, like ours, will continue. I hope and expect that he'll be here in a year's time and will wow us with further amazing accomplishments. Uh, I think maybe we'll give him the first of what I hope will be many rounds of applause. Please join me. Uh, Looking around at this gathering of exceptionally accomplished reporters and marveling at the continuing surge of achievements in high-end investigative reporting, uh, often of stories that are factually difficult and unbelievably hard to pin down, it's hard to imagine that we have a problem. I'm struck by the paradoxes of the current moment. Better journalism than ever and more news organizations on starvation rations. Mistrustful public, rancorous administration, and yet, you people are here with strong evidence of just how powerful and how important great journalism can be. So there's that on the one hand, on the other, this success is embedded in a news ecosystem that regularly peddles reports that are incoherent, inaccurate, misleading, or all three, and from a civic perspective, destructive and dysfunctional. So my big point is this that practitioners like you need to raise your gaze from your own craft to embrace a broader and more perplexing set of challenges. At stake is, is the future of this beleaguered and flawed process of social awareness that we call news. Journalists need to mobilize to bring their wisdom to bear on preserving and protecting that process of news. 
We, are, we, as journalists, are uniquely positioned to exercise influence, not just as practitioners, but as guarantors and guardians of this powerful system through which society's understanding of itself is tended and nourished and representative democracy is made possible. Why? Because it's to have just that, such a system that we have a First Amendment and a Fourth Estate. Because it's in grave danger and nobody else will take on this role. So let me, let me go on what do I mean specifically, what kinds of things do journalists need to be heard on. First is source protection. I first started thinking about this in connection with the ferocious pursuit of whistleblowers, which began with George W. Bush, and that's just to show perfectly partisan ecumenical, uh, the ecumenical approach of our government. It was in, broadened under Obama and is being hotly pursued under Trump. I'm amazed, I continue to be amazed by the acquiescence of the media when sources with truthful information of undeniable public importance are jailed. Now Chelsea Manning, whose principal sins included exposing war crimes and official corruption, is back behind bars having already served seven years. Seven years. You realize that Daniel Ellsberg, for leaking the Pentagon Papers, served not one night in jail. Um, Edward Snowden disclosed massive domestic surveillance that was declared illegal, is still in exile. Julian Assange, after nearly seven years in virtual house arrest in Ecuador's London Embassy, is likely heading to the U.S. to stand trial for coaching Manning in 2010. Don't sources deserve some measure of First Amendment protection? Why do journalists have considerable immunity from prosecution and not their sources? News is a process. It's not a unique profession, and protecting it means guarding its vital organs. That's why the colonists protected, protested the Stamp Act in 1765 because it raised the cost of paper. Paper was integral to public communications. There is no journalism without sources. There is no good reason as a matter of law, logic, or public policy that the right to convey true, publicly significant information in defiance of official pressures is something we believe has constitutional standing only when exercised by reporters. That the First Amendment reaches only as far as the newsroom door. That may spare reporters, but it imperils the entire news process. So secondly, second point, that concern gives us, gives journalists a pivotal role in the debate over the surveillance society. And I was talking to David Barstow about this yesterday and said that the way things have developed, you need to exercise tradecraft even with routine encounters with sources because they are so vulnerable and so exposed to surveillance. But journalists in our capacity as guardians of the news process, not just practitioners, need to ask whether all this surveillance chills the flow of publicly significant information to public attention. And since it clearly does, it is something we need to pay attention to and weigh in on and denounce. We have an important public resource to defend. My third point, standing up for sources is only one area where the defense of news freedom demands our attention. The greatest threat to that system, in my view, is the torrential assault on the public information grid from deliberate, polarizing content made possible by vast platforms that actually benefit from the most destructive features of the content. How much did YouTube make from the Christchurch shootings? Which genocide would our social media foment next and profit from? This matters. This poisons our well. This leads the public to mistrust in a sweeping way everything that they hear, including the hard-won fruits of your months of reporting. It's got to stop, and my point is that the insistence on enforceable standards of civic discourse can and should come from journalists. Journalists should take the lead in demanding stronger measures to control against fallacious and destructive content, to demand the same standards of care, accuracy, responsibility that we apply to our own work. Fourth, there's the money. The success of a small number of high quality news organizations to break even in this technological environment doesn't change the fact that most of the monthly news creators, most of the money news creators generate is appropriated by others. Journalists should never be supplicants. The work you do is invaluable and it makes a lot of people money. You need to insist on a revision of intellectual property rights to enable news organizations to harvest money from the markets to which they are indispensable. 
You need to make serious noises about corporate concentration and re-examine the antitrust laws to reinstate industrial dominance as a critical determination of regulatory intervention. And finally, we have a lot of friends out there we're not talking to. We don't tell them what we must. We don't tell them why we do what we do matters. And I applaud the New York Times and the Washington Post for their public service ads along these lines. It's not just the PR issue. Many of them would like to take part in a process of creating news about the world they, they inhabit. They have familiarity with that world. They have the passion to illuminate it. And God knows they have the tools thanks to the phones they have in their pockets. I want to point out that here at Berkeley, we're trying to reintroduce journalism training as an undergraduate option, not for people who want to be journalists, but for, but for people who want to be citizens. We want them to have the same communicative competencies that all of you have so they can talk, they can understand their world and communicate about it in responsible ways. They lack the skills, they would benefit from the guidance from professionals. Our challenge is to expand our own capacities to superintend the news process that embraces a committed but untrained workforce. At the moment, some of the most committed funders in this country, including Knight Foundation, which is here, and Craig Newmark, who is here, have pledged a lot of money toward a rebirth of local journalism. Perhaps the future of local journalism will require the mobilization of people who see covering their communities as, communities as a necessary part of their duty as citizens. It's remarkable that when we train people in civics texts, what is, what is the role of the press? We teach them to read newspapers. We don't teach them to talk to reporters or write for newspapers. And yet that is indispensable to the role of citizens. The future of local journalism, in my view, will require the mobilization of people who see covering their communities as a necessary part of their duty. We'll need guidance, there'll be training and supervision from well-trained professionals who not only know their craft, but know how to guide others to conduct it. So, is it time for us to step up? My overall point is one of enormous respect for the people in this room and the others who carry a sacred torch, and I have some feel for how hard that is, but I'm imploring you to build on your professionalism and skill and embrace a larger sense of social mission. You can carry on with your extraordinary journalism and still find yourselves presiding over a shredded, incoherent, destructive system of social mission, mission I beg your pardon, of social misinformation and an electorate, consequently, that is, that is following policies that are inhumane and morally insupportable. The challenge is to accept a mission of statesmanship. There's no professional or institutional force in civil society other than that is better informed and better equipped than journalists to exercise that broad-gauged leadership to demand the expressive freedom that alone can save us from the downward path we seem to be hurtling along. Thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of today. Thank you, Ed. Uh, for those of you who didn't see this morning's New York Times opinion section, you'll see a column by our dean on the source issue, and I, I commend it to you. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, David Lofman. Now a private attorney, David was the chief of the counterintelligence and Ex export control section of the National Security Division at the Department of Justice. Among other, among other things, he investigated leaks. He also oversaw the investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails, and before Robert Mueller was appointed special counsel, he oversaw the investigation of Russian government efforts to interfere with the 2016 election. David will give some remarks and then answer some of your questions. Welcome, David. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I may have to join the witness protection program after that speech by the dean. Um, I, uh, having overseen leak investigations at the Justice Department, I feel a little bit like the proverbial skunk at a picnic, but since I'm here at the cradle of the free speech movement, I will aim to persevere. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a brief overview of leak investigations, how they originate, the legal standards and procedures that govern them, and then uh, a recent case that illustrates how it works, and then you can politely stone me to death. So, um, so 
How do leak investigations begin? They typically begin with what you all do, the investigative journalism that we're here to talk about. And it generally prompts uh, what are referred to as crimes reports by the victim U.S. intelligence community agency that owns the information. Those crimes reports come into the Department of Justice for evaluation. And from a prosecution standpoint, historically the focus has been on the leaker as opposed to the news outlet that publishes the information given First Amendment considerations and litigation risks that would associate with going after the publishers themselves. And looming over how the Justice Department deals with the crimes report is what the government has to prove in the event of a leaked prosecution and the difficulties and risks associated with criminally prosecuting leaks. The law at issue is the Espionage Act of 1917 and particularly Title 18 of the U.S. Criminal Code, Section 793E. And in any criminal prosecution, whether it's leaks or bank fraud or money laundering, it's Department of Justice policy that the attorney for the government should not commence or recommend federal prosecution unless he or she believes that the admissible evidence will probably be sufficient to both obtain and sustain a conviction. And that foundational underpinning in what's called the principles of federal prosecution governs all federal criminal prosecutions. In a case involving the leak of a document, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a defendant had unauthorized possession of the document, the document related to the national defense of the United States, and the defendant willfully communicated, delivered, or transmitted that document to someone not entitled to receive it. In a case involving disclosed information, as opposed to a tangible document, the government also has to prove that the defendant had reason to believe the information could be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation. But whether a leak involves intangible information or a tangible document, the law does not require the government to prove actual or potential harm to, the, to U.S. national security as a result of an unauthorized disclosure. So let me briefly define what some of these terms mean. Unauthorized possession, for example, means possession of classified information by a person who doesn't hold a security clearance, holds a security clearance without the need to know that particular information, or holds a security clearance, has a need to know, but remove the classified information from the official premises where it was stored without authorization. And these are definitions that the courts have upheld. Information relating to the national defense, or NDI as it's um, known, has been very broadly construed by U.S. federal courts. The Supreme Court addressed the definition in a 1941 case of Gorin versus the United States and said that information relating to the national defense is a generic concept of broad connotations referring to the military and naval establishments and the related activities of national preparedness. Got it? Um, <laughs> the courts of appeals have added some gloss to that um, Supreme Court decision to constitute NDI. The Fourth Circuit has held that the information must be quote unquote closely held. Uh, the Second Circuit has said that if the information is obtained from sources that were lawfully available to anyone who was willing to take the pains to find, sift, and collate it, then it is not closely held. Uh, the classification of a document or information uh, is relevant, uh, but not necessarily determinative to whether it meets the definition of NDI. Willfully transmitted, one of the other elements the government has to prove. The government has to prove only that the defendant knew his or her conduct was unlawful. The government does not have to prove, the courts have held, uh, that the defendant intended to harm the United States, although evidence of that could be probative uh, in the event of a conviction at, at sentencing. Now, coming back uh, to when a crimes report is transmitted to the Department of Justice, um, the department created a questionnaire for the agency victimized by the leak to complete and forward along with the crimes report. And these questions are aimed at helping the Justice Department assess the viability of a criminal prosecution, including the likelihood of identifying the actual leaker and the government's ability to establish the elements of the offense, such as proving that the information was closely held, which sometimes is a high bar. And the questionnaire uh, includes 11 questions, or during Passover only four, uh, for the agency to respond to, 
such as what specific statements in the publication are classified, did the information come from a specific document, and if so, what is the origin of the document, what is the extent of official circulation of the document, that is to say elsewhere within the government, has the material been public, published officially or in the press to make an educated speculation of the matter possible? Will the information be made available for use in a prosecution? Will the agency permit prosecutors to use that information? And what effect might the disclosure of the classified data have on the national defense? And if the Justice Department determines that a criminal prosecution is viable, it will recommend to the FBI that it open an investigation. The larger the universe of people who received or had access to the classified information at issue, the less practicable it will be to conduct an investigation. Um, but if an investigation is commenced, then FBI agents will work with prosecutors from the Dep Department of Justice's National Security Division in my former section and with U.S. Attorney's offices, a U.S. Attorney's office uh, that has venue over the case, to conduct the investigation. And when that investigation commences, all the standard tools of criminal investigation are typically available. Grand jury subpoenas, uh, search warrants, including search warrants for the content of email communications, witness interviews, and so forth. But prosecutors must abide by Department of Justice policy and regulations that are intended to protect the news media from certain investigative tools, quote, that might unreasonably impair news gathering activities. And these standards are set forth in federal regulation as well as department policy. <clears throat> so for example, subpoenas in certain court orders can be used to obtain information from non-consenting members of the news media only if the information sought is, quote, essential to a successful investigation or prosecution and only, quote, after all reasonable alternatives have been made to obtain the information from alternative sources. Sometimes leak investigations result in criminal charges and sometimes they don't. Probably more often uh, they don't. Um, so in my closing minutes, I was just going to give you a quick, quick snippet uh, of a case uh, that we brought um, while I was at the department uh, involving a defendant by the name of Reality Winner. In June 2017, the Justice Department indicted uh, this young woman in Georgia for the willful retention and transmission of national defense information in violation of 18 U.S.C. 793E. Her name was Reality Winner. And after extensive pretrial litigation, Ms. Winner ultimately pleaded guilty to the indictment in August of 2018. And as part of her plea agreement, as typical in any plea agreement, she agreed to the truth of a statement of facts that the court accepted, and it included the following information. That she had worked as the employee of a private contractor assigned to a U.S. government agency facility in Georgia. She had a top secret sensitive compartmented information, or SCI, clearance, and she had access to NDI. She had received training regarding classified information and its protection, and the need to protect it from unauthorized disclosure. She knew that the unauthorized disclosure of top secret information could be expected to cause exceptionally grave damage to the national security of the United States, which is how top secret information is uh, defined. And on or about May 7, 2017, Ms. Winner searched for, identified, and printed a classified information report of a U.S. government agency dated just a few days earlier, which contained NDI. This intelligence report was marked top secret SCI, and it described intelligence activities by a foreign government directed at targets within the United States. And it revealed the sources and methods used to acquire the information in the report, so it was considerably sensitive. The information in the intelligence report Ms. Winter acknowledged was NDI, and she knew it was NDI. The information she knew was closely held by the U.S. government in that it had not been made public by the government and it was not found in sources lawfully available to the general public. But nonetheless, on the same day she searched for and printed the intelligence report, she also mailed it to an online news outlet with the intent that it be published. Now, in an earlier FBI agent affidavit at the time she was charged initially by complaint, the government explained how it had learned about Ms. Winter's conduct. The agent said in his affidavit that the news outlet which had received the intelligence report from Winter had contacted the U.S. government agency about an upcoming story. I'm sure that's a paradigm you're all familiar with. 
And the news outlet told the agency that it was in possession of what it believed to be a classified document authored by the agency. The news outlet provided the agency with a copy of the document, or at least a photocopy of the document, and the agency, as you might expect, examined that document and determined that its pages appeared to be folded or creased, suggesting that it had been printed and removed and hand carried out of a secured space. So naturally, the agency conducted an internal audit to determine who had accessed the report since its publication internally and learned that six people had printed it, including Winner. A further audit revealed that Winner had email contact with a news outlet, um, and that was pretty much the game for her. In its sentencing memorandum, the government also noted that Ms. Winner, in writing, had mocked the security training she had received. She had expressed hatred for the United States. She had expressed support for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and alleged NSA leaker Edward Snowden. And ultimately, pursuant to her plea agreement with the government, Winner agreed with the government to what she uh, acknowledged was an acceptable sentence, and she was sentenced to five years and three months, which I believe is the longest sentence a leaker has received in a criminal prosecution. So that's a capsule summary of a very paradigmatic leak investigation where all the cherries lined up in the machine pretty quickly. That's not usually how it goes, um, but sometimes from the government standpoint, the evidence materializes pretty quickly. So I'll stop there and be happy to deflect any questions you may have. <laughs> That's a, yeah. so we, have, we, have micro, we have microphones in the audience, and uh, given his um, willingness to, to step up here to the mic and, and answer questions, I hope that's what we get, our questions. Thank you. <laughs> Madam. Hi. Um, my name is Jennifer Janish. I'm with Investigative Studios um, in association with the IRP. Um, I was hoping that you would make what I think will be your first public remarks in the wake of the release of the Mueller report about the prosecution decisions, the declination decisions in both volume one, which outlines Russian interference and its nexus or lack thereof with the Trump campaign, and then, of course, volume two, which outlines what appears to be multiple instances of potential obstruction of justice, with Mul which Mueller ultimately declined to prosecute. I'll do my best within the limits I have to abide by. Um, well, first, let me just say that it was, as I expected, a very detailed narrative account of what, by any measure, was a very rigorous and comprehensive investigation, probably the same type of investigation you all would conduct um, as investigative journalists if you had access to all the sources and tools that the special counsel's office had. Um, so regarding volume one, the Russia investigation, I think by any standard, it's fair to say there was considerable damning evidence of contacts and attempted contacts between Trump campaign officials and Russians in connection with the campaign with the intent to benefit the campaign. That included multiple data points, but some of the most prominent obviously are the efforts by Mr. Papadopoulos to arrange a meeting between the campaign and the Russian government. That didn't pan out, but the attempt was made. The Trump Tower meeting, which has been heavily chronicled. Um, the transmittal of polling data to someone with reported ties to the Russian intelligence surface, uh, where it's pretty obvious from the narrative that uh, the intent, uh, which was accompanied by discussion, according to the report, of certain battleground states that figured prominently in the outcome of the election, was intended to further potential Russian influence operations. Um, so to say the least, it's misleading to say that the investigation did not establish coordination or that it was a failure or that it was a witch hunt. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, rather, as detailed in the report, they simply didn't develop sufficient admissible evidence to charge a criminal conspiracy to interfere in the 2016 election. That is not exactly a badge of honor. The report also detailed several instances of conduct consistent with an effort to obstruct the government's investigation. Now, I can't substitute my judgment for that of Mueller's team. They lived this thing for two years. They inhabited the investigation, and no one understands the nuances and rhythm and culture of an investigation unless you've inhabited it, unless you've conducted it. And I had to hand 
off my chapter of that early on, and so I'm not going to stand here and tell you whether I think um, you know the evidence does or doesn't warrant actual charges. But I do think um, it was wrong of the special counsel's office not to make a charging decision on obstruction, up or down. The special counsel's office had a mandate to do it from the acting attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, in his order appointing the special counsel's office. It would have been consistent with the special counsel regulations for the special counsel to make a charging decision. And according to what I read in the papers, Barr and Rosenstein were surprised that the special counsel's office did not make a charging decision, which to me is consistent, again, with the notion that they believe he had the authority to do so. The special counsel report in and of itself was an internal Department of Justice document intended only to be transmitted to the Attorney General. So arguably some of the same, some of the policy considerations in the Department of Justice um, that counsel against the public disclosure of derogatory information about uncharged persons would not have obtained precisely in the context of an internal report. Now, I understand there was concern about leaks, um, but I just don't think we can be paralyzed by the possibility of leaks um, in doing what otherwise might seem to be like the right thing to do. And um, if you look back at the history of the Clinton email matter and the IG report in that matter, the IG from the Department of Justice, there's reason to believe that Mr. Comey um, was motivated at least in part in sending his letter to Congress in October 2016 in which he announced the reopening of the Clinton email investigation, that he was motivated at least in part by the concern about potential leaks coming out of the New York field office. And then I have to say, looking at that volume, that it seems to me the special counsel's office violates some of the same considerations that it says it is adhering to for not publicly denigrating uncharged people by, for example, saying that they can't state with confidence that the President of the United States didn't commit obstruction and that their report doesn't exonerate him. To me, those things are consistent with, quote unquote, dirtying up someone who's uncharged in a way that's not too dissimilar from just coming out and saying it. So, you know, I understand and I don't gainsay that this was a principled decision, heartfelt, well-argued internally. Um, I just don't think they made the right decision. And it left a vacuum into which the political leadership of the Department of Justice happily stepped to substitute their judgment um, in a very politicized manner, undermining, in my estimation, the legitimacy of that decision, and under undermining public confidence in the integrity and independence of the department. And that's a bad place to be. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Russ Baker uh, here. Uh, uh, Hi, Russ Baker from Who What Why. Uh, I have a, I don't know if I'm allowed to do a two-parter, two so one's very, very short. Did you say that uh, Reality Winner uh, stated that she hated the United States? Yes, there were documents um, the government found in its investigation where she just expressed outright hatred for the United States. Was that the United States in general, or all of us, or Just certain localities, Berkeley. No, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure she parsed it that finely, um, but it's all part of the, uh, the case record. If you're interested, you can go back to, to see. I think the government's sentencing memorandum contained um, references to some of those materials. Okay, my, my second question concerns the, uh, what your reference to the uh, New York field office and Comey's concern about leaks. Did you, were you ever involved in looking into the origins of the whole Hillary Clinton thing, the discovery of the emails uh, on her server relating to uh, Anthony Weiner and how that whole story began? Was I involved in it? Yeah, or do, do you know anything about that? Well, I oversaw the department's investigation of the matter. So the short answer is yes. I guess I'm wondering if you can tantalize us can't a little. really say much more beyond that. You can't say any more. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Bruce Brown from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. You were in your position when the DOJ guidelines were um, revised in 2014, 2015. And I'm curious from your perspective, 
Uh, first, whether prosecutors um, generally find the compromises made in the new guidelines between strengthening protections for reporters versus preserving some of the interest for prosecutors um, have led to a revisions that prosecutors generally are happy with and can work under. And the second question specifically, if you could speak to the reluctance at DOJ to include national security letters within the 5010 guidelines, which was something that press advocates were pushing for when they were revised. Thanks. Let me begin by saying that um, I had to occupy an unhappy intersection um, where there was a not infrequent collision of two competing legitimate interests, the executive branch's obligation under the Constitution to carry out the laws and you all's constitutional responsibility to promote a free press. And um, those are sometimes irreconcilable. Um, the last, and, I, and let me just say too, that um, I can't think of a time where the need for a vibrant pre press has been greater. The last iteration of the revision of the guidelines occurred before I um, began my last, my last tour of duty at the department, which was in December 2014. But from a prosecutor standpoint, um, it won't be hard for you to understand because I'm sure all of you would like to expedite your own investigation. So, you know, if a bank robbery occurs and you know that there's an eyewitness to the bank robbery, you might want to talk to that eyewitness as soon as possible to see what he or she has to say um, about who committed it um, to help you solve the crime. And in a leak investigation, you know, the witness to the bank robbery, by analogy, is the reporter to whom the information was disclosed. So in a natural investigative setting, a prosecutor would go directly to the reporter and just say, you know, who gave you that stuff? But the department has constructed this regulatory scheme that erects, um, for good reason, um, a number of uh, hurdles and impediments to going from A to B, and instead often requires prosecutors to go from A seemingly to Z. And so the biggest tension from an efficiency standpoint in conducting these investigations is the regulatory requirement, unless the Attorney General waives it, to exhaust all reasonable alternatives. And that means sometimes having to conduct, you know, dozens or even hundreds of witness interviews. It stretches resources, it stretches the lifespan of these investigations. Um, there has been talk, as I'm sure you all know, about um, amending the department's media policy. I know there's a reporters committee that was set up that meets periodically with um, with the Department of Justice leadership, and they continue to make references to upcoming revisions. But that hasn't happened yet, and I would submit to you one of the reasons it, ha it hasn't happened is because it's no small thing for the department to modify policy that is aimed at validating the legitimacy of the First Amendment interests that protect a free press. Um, and so they're taking an exceptionally long time to do so. Thank you all. Thank you. I'd be happy to talk. Yeah. Yeah.